This is the valley, a vanished world from a forgotten time. Here on the Welsh borders, a farm is being run by five hand-picked experts as it would have been nearly 400 years ago. Using only resources available in the year 1620, they are laboring for a full calendar year, turning the clock back to rediscover a way of life from an age gone by. It's January now and it's our fifth month working on the farm and the weather outside is pretty cold, wet and miserable. We've had to bring the cattle in, so that means we're mucking out once a day, which is a pretty strenuous job. But the biggest thing we're doing this month is harvesting our timber supplies. We need all this lightweight stuff for things like the copper to keep us well supplied with hot water. And it also will supply us with timber for the main fires in the hall and for doing a lot of repair works. We need it for repairing tools, for doing little bits of building work, which is a good time of year to catch up on. Now, great thing about the wells, it's one of the few bits of water that doesn't freeze up on us at this time of year. And a good supply of hot water from that copper is essential. But our biggest task of the month is the hedge laying. We've got to get those boundaries stock proof before the spring. And this is the time to do it when the leaves are off and the animals are away indoors. Hedge laying is crucial for fixing boundaries on a farm. It keeps the animals out of areas where they'd cause damage. January was the usual time to catch up on farm maintenance. So professional hedge layer Nicholas McIlvenner has come to show Alex how it's done. So what we're doing here is actually just like filling the gaps here and we've got to make a stock proof barrier now. So we're going to be knocking in some stakes, weaving this in and then the whole thing is going to knock together in a year or two's time all the shoots will come through and you'll have a living a living fence basically that's the idea you're thinking kind of a whole generation ahead you're not really just thinking about you know putting a fence up and hoping it lasts 15 years here it's all about foresight and, and planning for the benefit of the farm this is the first time our team has had to face really bitter weather it may be pretty to look at but it makes working outside particularly arduous and it's not just themselves they have to worry about. They also have to look after their livestock. We've just had the first hard frost and snow of the winter. So we've got to break the ice up on the pond, or this will build up into a really thick layer. In London at the period, they could actually have frost fairs on the Thames because it was so solid. We're dependent on this for the water supply for the animals. Otherwise, I've got to start hauling it out of the well. And every one of those cows is drinking 10 gallons a day. So I can do without the extra work. Now that the shed for the cows is up and running, Ruth and Chloe are becoming dab hands at mucking out. Just there. Uh, a little bit further back. Okay. Excellent, thanks. I've got my little pile there. The muck's actually quite useful. We're going to be spreading this on the fields later on in the year. And, it's uh, not as easy as it looks either, is it? No. Oh, oh no. <laughs> Chloe does it about three times faster than me. <laughs> it's, it's a highly sophisticated art form. Well, at least we can see today with the sun up. Yeah, it's, it's really nice and light in here, actually. <sighs> Normally it's pitch black in here and you honestly can't see a thing. No, you really can't. So trying to distinguish the fresh straw from the, from the muck is virtually impossible. It's a very relentless job. You can't decide one morning, oh, don't think I'll bother, I think I'll have a light in this morning. Somebody's got to do it, so you have to get up. Rain or shine. So I put a bit of tension on him. Try and get a nice low cut. There he is. Hedge laying is all about manipulating what grows naturally. Provided they're cut only part way through, branches will continue to grow. Because the very fabric of the hedges remains alive, these boundaries literally grow stronger okay. over time. What will happen when this next year, or in the spring even, is that little buds are going to appear here, all the way along. And if I leave this hook here, they'll appear there as well, on the end. The tree will always grow at its ends. 
So that's why I'm going to chop the end off here as well. Yeah. See if you can get him up here. Oh, up there, yeah. Get that out of the yeah. way. Yep. Yeah. Over the top here. Yep. Yeah. Oh, I'm with you. Come on, back guys. Good, they are flexible, aren't they? Yeah, they are. And that's not going to kill it, that, is it? The fact no, that it's there, that'll keep it. That'll just encourage it to shoot there. It'll be all right. He's snagging up there. You can see where he's been rubbing on that branch. This may seem like a gentle, away. rustic pursuit, but it helps if Hedgley is a natural acrobat. If I can. Ugh. Of course, today, hedging is uh, considered a skill, but back in the, uh, the 17th century, it's just simply one of those jobs that you, you'd have to get done and, and you'd have to know how to do it. And of course, the skills it involves are very similar to many of the other jobs that I've been doing, in, in particular thatching as well, working with the hazels and the gads. So I'm beginning to consider myself more a jack of all trades rather than a master of one. Farmers had to be especially versatile to turn a profit. And at this time of year, a rather unusual harvest made for a lucrative sideline. Oak apples are created by a wasp that drills into the bark where it's thin on young oak trees and lay a grub inside the lump that the tree produces to protect itself. The oak apple is very rich in tannin and when mixed with a substance they call green copper ass, it would produce a black dye that was used either for dyeing cloth or for use as ink. In the reign of James I, about one in four people were literate. So the ink was becoming increasingly useful for writing. We have to grind the oak galls to a powder and the finer the dust, the smoother our ink will be at the end of the day. We now take an old vessel to mix in. This ink is poisonous, so we can't risk anything we're ever going to cook in again. And then add the green copper ass. So this they would have obtained from the merchants. And now a little water, not too much, or the ink will be too weak to work properly. Oops. And then just... Uh, And so, simply and easily, we have ink. Great, right, it's really coming together now. When I first looked at the stretch we were going to hedge, very much like it is down here, you've got all sorts of different sizes and it really just doesn't look very even at all. And yet when I look back up the hedge, it really looks really formal and really professionally laid. The more thorn and scrub and things that are sticking out towards the stock, it, the more they're gonna be put off it. It's not gonna look like really great and it keeps them away from the green shoots. So the aesthetics of it aren't that important. And really the natural form of the trees will define what it looks like and just trim it back roughly. Without modern utilities, 17th century farmers were not only governed by the yearly agricultural cycle, they also had to keep to a strict daily pattern. Here in the valley, the last job before the light goes is putting the cows to bed. So it's Spooda. Come on, in your pop. Come on, you. In you go. Good boy. Good boy. But the end of daylight doesn't mean the end of the working day. There are still jobs for Stuart and his son Alistair to be getting on with. There were many tasks that needed doing when you were fairly exhausted at the end of a long day and just sitting by the fire. Repairing the family's shoes was one of them. Every time I put one in, the next one bounces out. One of the best sources for the farmer's typical working day is a fellow called Gervais Markham who was writing in 1613 and he described um, 
a slightly idealised plough Monday. This is the first ploughing day after Twelfth Night, so early January. And he goes through from getting up well before dawn and going out with your lantern to tend to the stock, right through to the evening, supper time at six, and then sitting by the fire, crushing crab apples, mending the shoes, before you have a final trip out, check the stock are bedded down well for the night, and you turn in about nine o'clock-ish, get a good night's sleep, because you're going to be up again at about five or six in the morning. I think if you actually tried to follow his regime to the letter, you'd probably collapse from exhaustion within a few months, even somebody who's used to it. But if you take it with a pinch of salt and add in a bit more sort of social drinking and all the other activities that we know there's a lot of evidence was going on, you're getting a fair idea of the pattern of the working day. It's a bright January morning in the valley, and Ruth is following in the footsteps of farmers' wives 400 years ago, preparing medicines to combat the winter aches and pains. Just about every woman had at least some medical knowledge. Professional medicine was very expensive, um, both the ingredients and the advice. So for most people, domestic production was really the only sort of access to medicine. In fact, there's a, there's a quote from a chap called Robert Green, 1595, saying, I make my wife my doctor and my garden my apothecary shop. <laughs> and that about sums it up, really. I'm making here a sage oil, which was thought to be good for rheumatic joints, pains in the joints. So particularly this time of year when it's, you know, you're working outdoors a lot in the damp and the cold, it's the sort of thing that you want to have big stores of. I've got a load of oil in here in which I've been boiling um, some sage leaves until they've gone crispy. All the juices from the sage has now come out of the, the sage leaves and gone into the oil. I'm going to discard this first lot, and then I'm going to put a whole fresh lot in. And then this other batch of stuff I'm working on here, I've made an infusion in water with rosemary, which frankly looks a bit gunky. We're going to distill it. Distilling was done using an alembic, a pottery cone with a spout. By cooling it on the outside, the liquid condenses inside and slowly drips out. So I'll just wring that out and pop them round. And it's easy enough then to sort of just change your cloths if they dry out. By distilling, it was possible, even at home in the 17th century, to extract the essence of herbs and plants, not far removed from the essential oils that can be bought in chemists today. Down at the bottom end of the farm, in Elfield, Alex and Fons have been busy putting into practice their hedging skills. We want to stop putting sheep in this field. We're having to work on the boundaries to stop them escaping. And we've used a sort of a variety of hedging techniques. This is a holly tree that we've felled. We made a few mistakes. We should have had a few um, stakes in here. One of the big problems we found with live hedging was the fact that if you leave the hollies for too long and they get too thick, they become immensely brittle and they're really hard to work with. And that makes it really difficult to, to wind in all these branches. But we've created a fairly robust boundary. I mean, this is, as, as Fon says, it's only for sheep. But this, this runs quite nicely into our dead hedge, mm. which goes down here. And the problem here was that we didn't have any species at all to work with. So we chopped down some oak, we've chopped down some birch as well. What we've done is we've broken it all up and just, I suppose, just experimented, really. Yeah. Hedges were fast workers, according to Gervais Markham's farm manual. He specifies that a good dead hedger would accomplish around 32 feet a day of hedgerow five feet high. Now, I'm going to be fairly generous to the chap, and that in reality, if I'm standing up here level with the hedge, it's only about three feet. And he says that anything shorter than five feet and, and not as thick as it should be for cattle, maybe we're looking at about 65 feet a day for one hedger. Now, we took, how long did we take on this? We took a day and a half to do this. A day and a half. Day and, and a half it's... between two of us. Yeah, we, we, we've got to get... Um, but we are getting better, aren't we? We are getting better, yeah. but, um, you know, we've got lots of practice. There's many fields that need, um, need the hedges sorting, so, um, yeah, we better crack on, Fons. Yeah. By straining off the sage oil, it can be stored for later use. I'm just going to put it to one side to cool down and then I'll pop a lid on it. 
as well as the oils and distilled waters, a farmer's wife of the period would have been able to make a whole range of other preparations with the herbs. Pills, troshes, which are a bit like sort of lozenges, um, syrups, electories, which are things um, preserved and boiled in honey. Um, I'm going to do a salve next uh, for putting on open wounds and sores. The main ingredient is elder buds, considered especially good for cooling wounds and preventing infection. To them are added some candle wax and a good dollop of pig fat. Just want it all to sort of melt together, so I'm going to take that straight off the heat, give it a bit of a stir, and then I shall put it straight away into a little pot to set solid. January was a key time for managing woodlands. Wood was one of the most essential elements in people's lives and an important cash crop, vital for everything from building to keeping them warm. So our team are out harvesting in the coppice. We have to coppice the woodland when the leaves are off the trees, so January is a good month for it. And coppicing is a very ancient way of managing woods in this country goes back to at least Roman times and before. So it gives you a sustainable crop of timber. <sighs> the idea is that you knock the tree over, cut it off, and it will then reshoot from the base. If you planted a hazelnut, <sighs> then that tree would grow to maturity and die in about 150 years. But you can find in corners of this country the stools, the bases from which hazels that are coppice still regrowing, that are 2,000 years old. The wood has a multitude of uses. Everything from bundles of faggots used to fire up the bread oven to timber needed for construction. If you were to pop down your local DIY store, there's normally a couple of shelves dedicated to different types of dowling, different thicknesses of wood. This is essentially what the copse is doing in the 17th century. For example, the hazel here. You know, you can take off your one or two year shoots, which are very thin and very flexible, or you can take off your seven, eight year shoots, which are a little bit thicker, and then finally, you'll go up to something that's maybe 10, 15 years, and they all have different uses. The use of wood was so great at this time that timber supplies in Britain were dwindling. So much so that the government began to impose restrictions. You're also leaving, by law at this period, 12 large trees for each acre because you needed big timber for things like ships to protect the shores of this country. At the end of a long, hard day, Ruth has a chance to try out her 17th century remedies on her first willing patient. This is the elder salve that uh, I made her before with the buds and the pig fat and wax. Do you want to give me a finger? Yeah, I clouted the um, top of my finger the other day with the mallet and it keeps opening up. And what's happening, in fact, is that um, it's making the, the joint sort of swell up as well, so restricting movement. All right, injury number one out of the way with. Right, you got more, have you? Indeed, yes, I have. Here we go, then. A lot of the force I'm using the billhook with is going right through my elbow, and I do suffer from what today is called tennis elbow. I suppose it must have been called hedger's elbow at the time. <laughs> hedger's bill. Um, but, yeah, that, I mean, that's been, that's been chronic, especially with the cold, um, so I'm yeah. really, really suffering there. So I don't know what you've got in your box um, of tricks. Well, I think probably some sage oil. You want to roll your sleeve up? Right, sorry about cold hands. That's all right. I'm just going to rub it. Oh, you might want to rub that on yourself, actually. Do you want to just rub it in? Just give it a really good sort of massage into it. The physical labour it, it is well, it's beginning to take its toll on me. And you wake up in the morning and the arm's a bit creaky and my back as well when I get up. I find it really difficult just to 
bend down to get my socks on, but hopefully these ointments will work. <laughs> Fingers dealt with, elbows dealt with, but right. it's the, the chesty cough is another one that oh. I'm, I'm suffering from at the moment. So. The medical thinking of the time held that people were made up of four elements or humours. Coughs and colds were thought to be caused by an excess of the cold, wet humour, phlegm. So all I'm going to do is give you a mustard plaster. You know, like in that nursery rhyme, when Jack and Jill fall down the hill and they bandage his head with vinegar and brown paper? Well, that's a plaster. I've got some mustard and honey here. <laughs> and this is going to be bound onto his chest. It's going to be pretty sticky. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to smell like a gammon ham once this has been on me. <laughs> <laughs> I think you are. <laughs> if we were a wealthier family, of course, we'd, we'd probably sort of, you know, make you up some pills with things like ginger and pepper, you know, which were also hot ingredients, but really, really pricey, whereas right. this is pretty cheap, really. Here we go. Oh, you're going to love this. Ready? Yeah, OK, go. Go. Oh, oh, God. Up. oh. oh no. <laughs> God, it's cold. <laughs> it is. I thought it was supposed to be hot and dry. Oh. Well, it will be in a minute. There we go. <laughs> you're right there. Shirt on. I've used these sorts of housewifely medicines for quite a lot of years, really, in, in some way or other. And some of them, some of them work. Um, most of them, they are really placebos, to be honest. Um, mind you, one shouldn't underestimate the power of a placebo. Especially when it's dripping all down my belly as well. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not bath night for another five nights. <laughs> It's a new day. Time for Alex and Fonz to take on the biggest project of the new year, Triangle Field. They've already cleared the mass of bracken and bramble that was here in September. Now they're trying to turn it into a working field where they can sow their spring crops. Without modern machinery, they're relying instead on the livestock. Come on. The cows will be the first animals that we'll take into the, into the field and they'll take off all the, all the big stuff. Then after that, we'll be looking to get the sheep in there just to nibble down the last bits and pieces. And then finally, of course, the pigs will go in to root out all the, all the roots and the tubers and all the grubs as well. I mean, this whole process of turning Triangle Field into arable land, it's something that would have taken place over probably many years. But we're going to accelerate the process. So it's a kind of unquantifiable workload for us. Come on. While Alex and Fonz get busy, Stuart is rustling up a good winter dinner. For a household 400 years ago, January marked the start of leaner times. We've now looking at long life foods, salted like the gammon, pickled with the gherkins, dried with the peas and the grains that we're using here. Back in 1620, if you didn't salt the pig, it would have uh, rotted within a few days of actually being killed. This one's got a yellowish tinge because this gammon has been up the chimney smoking. It has a number of preserving effects. Partially it desiccates it, so it'll dry it out, but also it puts a toxic layer on the outside as well, which is going to deter a lot of bacterial action. The total of all those preserving effects on this chunk of Arthur's back leg means that since we killed him in November, it's almost in the same condition as it was then. So, to the pot. It's a quiet time in the valley's vegetable garden, with only the hardiest of crops left to harvest. Uh, kale for supper. It's a really hardy vegetable. One of the colwort family is uh, most of the things in this bed. Cabbages of all sorts are called colworts. Um, and they last us right through the winter. They'll cope with the frosts and things. Very, very common. In fact, so much associated with being the vegetable of the poor that um, People often call this sort of like gardens, kale yards. I know when I lived in Chester, there's an area there called the kale yards, just outside the city walls behind the cathedral. Big flat area. I'm going to leave the stalks in the ground. I cut this one um, last week. And you can see there's little bits of regrowth coming. So if the weather stays mild, I might get another crop off the same stalk, at least a small one anyway. So I'm just going to take the tops off. One of the dishes on the menu is a classic, traditional one. 
Peas pudding. I'm not going to put quite the whole amount in. And that will be far more by the time it's full of peas pudding than we need. But as the rhyme says, peas pudding hot, peas pudding cold, peas pudding in the pot nine days old. There's references to people at the period cutting a slice of peas pudding, like you might cut a slice of cake, and just putting it in their pocket and going out for the day. The next very simple dish found right to the lowest social levels is just a dish using whole grains. All we do is put this in the pot, boil it until the grains burst. It's got various names. Uh, some areas it's called frumentry. In other areas, particularly down in the West Country, they call it wash brew. If you can afford it, you can improve the flavour with a little milk or honey or whatever um, you can stretch to. Even wine if you're really uh, well to do. So, into the pot. Pretty lean time in the garden at the moment. Not much left in here. I've got a few root vegetables still, some carrots and parsnips. I've got some leeks coming. They're still too small for harvesting, but come spring they'll be ready. Don't really want to be out here that much because if you walk on the soil too much, you compact it down and lose all the air spaces, and then things don't grow quite so well. So I've got some winter pruning to do. Mind um, the gooseberries? They're getting rather overcrowded. So I shall be taking quite a lot of the wood out of this one, make a nice open framework so lots of air can get through, and that way we'll get a really good crop, hopefully with no mildew on the fruit. Yep, that's soft as butter. But it's far too hot to actually uh, start stripping the rind off yet. So let's put that aside for a minute. The gammon is going to be seasoned with fresh herbs from the garden, rosemary and sage. Then the outer rind and excess fat has to be stripped off, the bone removed, and the meat smothered in a pastry case with lashings of butter. And away we go. Crimp it on. Now this is going to take about half an hour in the bread oven, the meat's pre-cooked, so all we're doing now is baking off the pastry. Five months into the project, and the team have settled into the pace of 17th century life. Wow, look at that. That is fantastic, Stuart. Ooh, beautiful. That, that looks delicious. delicious. That looks really good. Has everyone got gherkins? Have you got gherkins up there? Right, it's got a good zing from the rosemary. Developing a bit of a cold, actually. Dinner by the fire offers a chance to reflect on another busy day. Why don't you wear the hat? Oh, I, d I don't mind. I don't mind the hat. It just, have, it just feels a little bit tight sometimes on the head. Try my statue cap. That's a sort of different shape. Mm. It might work better. No, it's a much. Yeah, it's a much looser fit actually. Yeah. That's what I can't put it down. See what happens. Yeah, it's sort all of. The way down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but nice. I quite like the jaunty angle, though. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. They're called statute caps because there was at one point uh, an actual law saying, you know, a statute saying that people should wear knitted caps so that the poor... A statute, a law? Yeah. A hat law? Yeah. Excellent. Everybody, it was supposed to be, everything, everybody except um, ladies, gentlemen and ladies' maids were supposed mm. to wear knitted caps and that way poor people could knit caps and make a living. January's gone well for the Valley team. <laughs> They've yet to shirk from their relentless physical labours. But how will they fare as winter drags on, with snow on the horizon? Next time on the valley, it's February. A heavy fall of snow transforms the farm. <laughs> Building a lavatory, 17th century style, of course. And it's time to bring the sheep in for a thorough checkup. You're not going anywhere, girl. 